Uh, Mitrashtale and uh, on behalf of the Central Tibetan Administration and especially from the Department of Information and International Relations in conjunction with the Tibet Bureau Office of, uh, of Geneva, I would like to extend greetings to all of you, uh, you know, present here, uh, you know, our distinguished speakers, uh, honorable member of parliaments, uh, respected representatives of the offices of Tibet to London, Brussels, and our Paris coordinator, and uh, respected uh, community leaders, you know, uh, you know, Tibetan community leaders from Tibetan associations and uh, you know, Tibetan NGOs, and also our longtime friends and supporters from Europe representing Tibet support groups, and to the 17 Tibetan youths uh, you know, from different parts of Europe who have taken the time and also the initiative to attend this fifth uh, Geneva Forum. So I thank you all for your presence here. So <clears throat> with this um, August gathering of experts, scholars, um, activists, advocates, defenders, practitioners, parliamentarians, policy makers, community leaders, and students, we consider the Geneva Forum to be a great platform and also a great opportunity for all of us to network, to deliberate, and also to collaborate, and also to strategize on spotlighting on the critical human rights situation of um, different regions under the authoritarian and totalitarian regime and rule of the People's Republic of China. So <clears throat> this Geneva Forum is happening against the backdrop of the United Nations Universal Periodic Review of China's human rights record for the past four years. And it is upon us who live in free countries of the world to speak up for them and to make every effort to right the wrongs and to hold the perpetrators accountable in order to make them or to transform them into a responsible global stakeholder. So the CCP, under the leadership of the President uh, Xi Jinping, has been increasingly engaged in an aggressive and assertive behavior which is not only threatening the regional security and peace, but also the international rules-based order and the democratic values that we all share. So I was uh, recently uh, you know, participating in the recently concluded uh, 27th conference of the Forum 2000, which was held in Prague. So, um, in one of the sessions, I was captivated listening to the very powerful speech that Mr. Larry Diamond gave on democracy and authoritarianism. And as you all know very well, Larry is a leading contemporary scholar on democratic studies. So what resonated the most with me of his speech is the commonality of themes like legitimacy crisis, an immense fear over the loss of political power and control that characterizes authoritarian regimes like China, Russia, and many other countries in this world. So these elements drive the authoritarian regimes to employ multiple tools of repressive measures domestically and also to engage in aggressive foreign policy behavior and influence operations in order to enforce and also to secure legitimacy at all levels. So, <clears throat> uh, so the PRC government at this time is facing legitimacy deficit in Tibet, Taiwan, Hong Kong, East Turkestan, Manchuria, Inner Mongolia, and many other regions where 
the resistance movements and activities still persist in different forms and in different degrees. And as expected out of an authoritarian regime like China, China's policy response to these persecuted group, groups has, have been one of stability maintenance. So this is crushing dissent, monopolizing every means of public expression that contradicts the official CCP's position, governance, and policies, and also ensuring compliance to CCP's rule and legitimacy. Therefore, it is the human rights violations in China is symptomatic of larger issues, including legitimacy crisis. And uh, if I am to contextu uh, you know, contextualize the case of Tibet, because the central theme of the fifth Geneva Forum is human rights and decline, regions under China. So if I may contextualize the case of Tibet within that. So uh, it is noteworthy that Tibetan freedom struggle movement is one of the longest running nonviolent freedom struggle movement of our contemporary times. So in this day and age, where politics of reciprocity and economic interests dictates the flow and rhythm of international relations and its diplomacy, the continued existence and relevance of Tibet can only be attributed to the strong moral leadership and visionary leadership of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the indomitable determination of Tibetans inside Tibet, despite all odds, the resilient spirit of the exiled Tibetan community, and the unwavering support of our supporters and friends of Tibet. And most importantly, the element of truth, justice, and dialogue which defines and characterizes the Tibetan freedom struggle movement has led to its existence, sustenance so far, and which is, I think, all due to the ethical leadership of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in this conflict-ridden and interest-driven world. So um, there is this very a famous book, The Power of the Powerless, which is by late Czech president, Václav Havel, where Václav Havel had explained on the importance and meaning of living in truth as being crucial to breaking the chains of totalitarianism. So coming back to Tibet, the Sino-Tibet conflict is still unresolved and the present situation inside Tibet is being described by Human Rights Watchdog as giant open prison. And Freedom House has consistently listed Tibet as the least free nation for the last five years. And since the invasion and occupation of Tibet by the People's Republic of China, China has systematically implemented radical policies that is causing large-scale assault on Tibetan culture and Tibetan identity, leading to some of the observers to say that the current condition of Tibet is similar to facing cultural genocide. And the level of repression inside Tibet is very much evident from the fact that we have had, as of now, since 2009, 157 known cases of Tibetans who have self-emulated or burned themselves to death in protest against China's oppressive rule and policies. And uh, in, in terms of Tibetan Buddhism, PRC authorities consider Tibetan Buddhism as a source of challenge to their state legitimacy, 
because of his strong identification with Tibetan culture and Tibetan identity. So there is a lot of state interference in religious affairs, from implementation of Petroitic re-education campaign, anti Dalai Lama campaign, indoctrination, sinicization, interference in reincarnation system. So all these have reduced the space and scope for the practice of Tibetan Buddhism. And the Beijing's efforts to appropriate and control the reincarnation system is seen by many as an issue of legitimacy and authority over Tibet and Tibetans. So in 2011, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has released a written document which clearly reaffirmed that His Holiness has the sole legitimate authority over the reincarnation process of the 15th Dalai Lama. So with that document, that is the most authoritative document we have had from, uh, from our side. So that document denies the CCP any future legitimacy and, and any agency to interfere in the selection and recognition of the 15th Dalai Lama. So we have another classic uh, case of China's interference in reincarnation system, and that is the case of Benchen Rinpoche, Gendin Chögyinima, who has been held in communicado since 1995. And despite international pressure, repeated requests for access, the Chinese authorities have refused to establish his health, his whereabouts, and his well-being. And now, you know, as a part of legitimacy building exercise, including extensive use of sinicization efforts, Tibet Action Institute has reported that nearly a million Tibetan children from the age of four to 18 have been forcibly put up in residential, colonial style residential schools all across Tibet in order to be sinicized to be indoctrinated and to be de-Tibetanized. So, in, um, so this kind of assimilationist approach to education and PRC's fundamental emphasis on building socialist state with Chinese characteristics is causing alienation and extermination of Tibetan culture and Tibetan identity. And in terms of ecological concerns and flawed you know, development policies inside Tibet, Tibet, as you know, is commonly referred to as the third pole, the roof of the world, the water tower of Asia, because Tibet has the largest ice mass containing 46,000 glaciers. So over 1.4 billion uh, people from the global population depends on Tibet's water system for food, security, agriculture, transportation, and fisheries. And uh, in terms of you know, development programs that are being implemented inside Tibet, it is very concerning that all these development programs are being formulated and implemented without taking into consideration proper environmental assessment, and also without the participation of the local community stakeholders. So what we say is that China's investment and development policies and programs inside Tibet has been devoid of the need-based approach and the right-based approach, because Tibetans have no say in the decision-making processes that impacts their lives and they have no participatory power to engage in the implementation process. And it is a fact that China has invested lots of money into developing Tibet, but the nature of development, the development for whom, and also the nature of development, the lopsided and overriding focus on hard infrastructure 
that is building roads, railways, dams, these have not upgraded, improved, or benefited the lives of Tibetan population overall in terms of the sectors such as education and healthcare. So um, not only that, and then uh, China is very, um, uh, very sophisticated in, uh, in employing uh, deceptive methods and coercive methods to influence the international information environment, public discourse, and official narrative. So right now, China's manipulation, information manipulation tactics include propaganda, one, second is disinformation, and third, censorship. Even President Xi Jinping has directed his state media to tell the China story well so that the global community can be positively influenced. And, uh, and on Tibet, China's disinformation tactic can be fundamentally uh, uh, targeted at countering Tibet's historical status as an independent nation before the PRC's invasion and occupation. And instead of that, propagating alternative narrative of Tibet being a part of China since antiquity, and forcing the international community to accept this narrative. And there have been efforts to undermine the, in, um, the image and also the reputation of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in order to shape international perception as part of the disinformation campaign. And in terms of surveillance strategy in Tibet, and also in East Turkestan, the traditional security surveillance apparatus of military, police, neighborhood spies, these are being extensively used. And in addition, in recent times, modern security surveillance technology are also being used to surveil the people and, it, and their movements. And reports by Citizen Lab and by Human Rights Watch have found that over 1.2 million Tibetans were subjected to arbitrary and mass forcible collection of DNA samples, which may be abused for surveillance purpose in the future. And China conducts the most sophisticated and global campaign of transnational repression. And under that campaign, it actively seeks to interfere, intimidate, and harass people who live outside of China, and particularly those who have been politically active. So it is reported that uh, Chinese, Tibetans, Inner Mongolians, Hong Kongers, in 36 different countries are being subjected to China's transnational repression and Freedom House has labeled China as the most prolific perpetrator of transnational repression. So, so what can we do? And what, what can we prioritize effectively to counter the China challenge? So on a governmental level, it is important that the foreign policy priorities are based on the rule of law, human rights, and democracy. And then whatever support that international community has, for example, for Tibet and other persecuted groups, be institutionalized in legislative acts, like the US Tibet Policy and Support Act. And then it is important and imperative that common alliances be formed of like-minded partners based on common liberal values, common democratic agenda, and common persecution concerns. And it is also important that governments hold China responsible and accountable for any misdeeds and misuse of power, both at the bilateral engagement level and also at multilateral forums like the United Nations. 
And it is also important that we prevent the revisionist and expansionist agenda of authoritarian regimes like China and Russia to influence the international norms and standard setting. And it is also important to engender the culture, significance, and relevance of negotiation and dialogue as the way forward to resolve international conflicts, including the Sino-Tibet conflict. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama has repeatedly emphasized over the years that it is unrealistic to expect unity and stability under brute force. So in order to achieve harmonious society within China, harmonious society within Tibet, within Taiwan, Hong Kong, East Turkestan, Inner Mongolia, Manchuria, and other, and other persecuted nations, communities, and groups, it is highly important that there is a clear need and urgency to first of all acknowledge and then to address the core concerns and fundamental grievances of the affected people. Many human needs theorists believe that conflict over needs are fundamentally different from conflict over interest because interests are negotiable, needs are non-negotiable. So for example, in Tibet, protests happen, protests continues to happen, and these protests are fundamentally, essentially, pleas by the Tibetans to let Tibetans be Tibetan and allow them the space and right to express their Tibetanness in their own land. So this is a fundamental need. So it is proven beyond doubt that propaganda, brute force, development incentive cannot be the ultimate answer to many of the unresolved conflict issues that are currently remaining uh, unresolved. So I hope that political will and wisdom will prevail on authoritarian regimes like China and Russia and that we look forward to more positive change within China and also resolution to the Sino-Tibet conflict based on the middle way policy because CTA is fundamentally and firmly committed to the dialogue process to negotiate with the Chinese counterpart in resolving the Sino-Tibet conflict. So, and then we also hope and pray that our brothers and sisters in Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, East Turkestan, Mongolia, and Manchuria, we all have more freedom and more peace in the years to come. And I really thank you so much uh, for your attention and for your presence, and very much look forward to your insightful presentations, expert deliberations, and hopefully an action-oriented declaration at the end of this forum. So I thank you all so very much. Thank you.